Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, August 23rd, 528 a.m. Central Time. Grain markets are mixed this morning. Pretty quiet overnight trade. December corn futures down a quarter cent at 393 and a quarter. November soybeans up two and three quarters at 964 and a quarter. Wheat futures off three or four cents across the board. Made some fresh lows yesterday. Matt Bennett is with us today. Guys, let's start off with the crop tour. Pro Farmer found poor corn potential up in Minnesota. The tour pegged the state's corn yield at 164.9 bushels per acre, down sharply from last year and the lowest since 2012. USDA, however, projects that the state's corn yield will be unchanged from last year at 185 bushels per acre. Excessive rainfall early in the growing season likely resulted in reduced yield potential. Soybean pod counts in Minnesota were better by comparison and were very close to the three-year tour average. All right, Matthew, I would contend that these tour findings and the action in the corn market overnight, which was zero, there was zero action in the corn market overnight. This is excellent evidence of the idea that traders and the market don't care about the tour because they found some ugly stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree that they're not super concerned with it. I think overall they feel like the crop's big enough considering the circumstances. You know, we've got tons of stocks uh domestically and worldwide i think whenever i look at the tour for instance for minnesota you know just knowing what i know about the tour i was on a few years uh you know in the past i mean it's the tours uh or the the um the routes you know they're all in the southern part of minnesota of course that's where they were hardest hit i mean they were going to see the uh the worst of the worst I, I i don't um you know i don't question chip whatsoever he's got great methodology it is a, a really good um, a lesson and, you know, and, and trying to come up with the yield. But, you know, maybe other parts of Minnesota are just a little bit better, relatively speaking, than what they typically are. But, I mean, that's where the bulk of production is. So there's no question in my mind Minnesota's a mess. I've got growers in that part of the world that, you know, I, they were lobbying to be called a disaster area early yeah. in the year. I mean, I know it was pretty intense. And so uh, there's no question in my mind Minnesota's down. How much? That's the big question. So what's more surprising to you? Is it more surprising that the tour says Minnesota's corn yield is going to be down, what, 16 bushels versus last year? Or is it more surprising to you that USDA says the yield is going to be unchanged versus last year? It's more surprising that the yield would be unchanged from the USDA. I thought that that was super interesting Interesting in the August uh, WASD. Um, I, to be honest, it was probably one of the most shocking ones that there was. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I don't know. I mean, I felt like all of us were looking at Minnesota saying that's kind of a wild card. I mean, people forget, you know, Minnesota uh, oftentimes in the top five. I mean, yeah. they produce a lot of corn and, yeah. and it's a very important state. So, um, yeah, I, I think USDA was way too high. I thought that uh, for the August WASD. You know, and I think that maybe there's a few places that you can maybe chip away at this thing. Clearly, there could be uh, the case that big crops get bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, that's a pretty big miss if pro farmers more right than USDA. With regard to Minnesota soybeans, kind of a different story, basically on par with the three-year tour average. So not as big of a deal there. Uh, let's jump to Iowa. So the state's corn crop was pegged at a tour record of 192.8 bushels per acre compared to last year's 185.8 bushels per acre. USDA most recently pegged the state's corn yield at a record 209 bushels per acre. Soybean, uh, soybean pod counts were up sharply compared to last year and were close to the previous tour record from 2010. USDA projects the state's soybean yield at 61 bushels per acre, up from 58 bushels per acre last year. I suppose, despite some problems in the north with the excessive rainfall, the two are kind of confirmed what we already knew about Iowa. This is not surprising to me at all. Um, record crop potential. Yeah, huge crop in Iowa. There's parts, uh, several parts of Iowa that, you know, you probably talk to growers as well as I have that say they think they've got the best crop ever. And so yeah. it's a similar uh, tone in Illinois uh, and in parts of Indiana as well. So, you know, it's a big crop. I think one thing that really sticks out uh, that I don't know if everyone's paying attention to it, but pod counts in pretty much every state are big. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking a pretty big crop. So, you know, if I had to take uh, which one, relatively speaking, would have better potential to grow, you know, in this next report, 
I got to say soybeans as far as a percentage level. You know, I think this bean crop could be understated by a couple bushel anyway. So uh, I do think this is a very large bean crop. It's got big potential. Yes, we have had areas that haven't been super uh, um, wet, you know, in the month of August. But at the same time, uh, temperatures up to this point that uh, have actually uh, been great for grain fill and pod fill. And, and so uh, I've got to think that this crop has done nothing but get bigger. If you're right about the soybean yield and USDA comes up with that already record yield number, you've, I mean, we've already got a serious supply and demand problem in soybeans. And I would argue based on export sales, that stuff, the demand side's overstated. If they're understating the crop, I mean, could the market get to a place where it's, it's trading like an 800 million bushel carry out. Cause that's sounds like that's where we're headed. If, if what you're saying is, is remotely accurate. Yeah. I mean, I think you and I agree on this, Joe, but uh, there are, we already, in my opinion, uh, with the USDA's numbers, as far as production, uh, if, if uh, I was using my export demand figure, you know, we would be, you know, within a hundred of the number you just came up with, you know? And so yeah. I think you're probably at 700 carry right now. Uh, you know, I'm not just trying to be bearish. I'm just being realistic. I'm looking at sales. I'm looking at facts. And so that's all we can really go on. And, and so I do think that the bean crop will get bigger. I really do. I think. OK, so then if, the, if that's the soybean crop, if there are people who believe if 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 big traders believe that we could end up at a 700, 800 carry out there, the market's job right now is to find a level that's cheap enough that that results in that not happening. Mm -hmm. They try to find, we're going to try to find a price that stimulates demand. We're seeing some better demand. We'll get to export sales in a second here. Uh, the Canadian, <clears throat> the Canadian rail strike will end quickly. Workers at Canadian National will return to work today, just hours after the Canadian government moved to end the work stoppage. The work stoppage continues at Canadian Pacific, Kansas City, although the Teamsters Union and company officials are slated to meet today. The Canadian government is essentially ending the work stoppage through the Canadian Industrial Relations Board. Prime Minister Trudeau had previously stated that he wanted to see an agreement made at the bargaining table. Trains are likely to begin running within days and should take about a week to catch up with regard to shipments. We don't need to spend a ton of time on this because it looks as if it's mostly inconsequential. Um, but yeah, the government in Canada basically has a way of saying, get back to work. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, do you think there was some concern about fertilizer in particular, Matt? I do. I mean, I do think there was some concern, but, you know, clearly this didn't really last too long. So, no. uh, you know, I think that fades away pretty quickly. All right. Non-story. Let's go to export sales. New crop U.S. corn and soybean export commitments remain soft. The book of new crop soybean sales is the worst since 2019 and the second worst since 2000, 2009. Chinese purchases of new crop U.S. soybeans are the third worst seasonally of the last 10 years behind only 2018 and 2019, two years associated with the U.S.-China trade war. Total U.S. new crop corn export commitments are the fifth worst of the last 10 years, but are slightly below average. Uh, China has not purchased a single bushel of U.S. corn for new crop delivery. Let's jump back to soybeans. This is this is the problem. Uh, the book of new crop export sales is very poor. China's purchases have been very weak compared to what they uh, would typically do. And this goes back to what we discussed earlier and that USDA based on what we know right now, and it's early, but based on what we know right now, they may be overstating new crop exports by a substantial amount. I thought, yeah, it's putting them mildly. you know, I, I don't know without some major, uh, movement on this and, and guys, we got to be clear. Like, um, uh, our heyday is between harvest, which is right around the corner, you know, and, and into January, February. And for us, you know, to see uh, sales where they're at, it's concerning to me because, you know, we need to be but we need to be pumping out a ton of beans here before too awful long. And the, the other thing that's a little bit concerning, of course, is, you know, Mississippi River levels, you know, have dwindled as well. And so draft levels continue to kind of go lower. Uh, we've turned off dry. Um you know, and I tell you what, Joe, there's uh, there's some reason to be very concerned that our export situation could it could change quite a bit. <laughs> you change the supply and demand balance sheet in the way that we're talking and it's not friendly towards prices whatsoever. No, beans, I, I think when you look at like corn versus soybeans and even throw wheat in there, the beans and, and the balance sheet potential for the United States is is by far the worst. I'm not I mean, corn export sales are just I call them lackluster. They're not bottom of the barrel, but 
they're not anything to write home about either. Mm -hmm. uh, we need some we need some better demand across the board. USDA released weekly drought monitor data yesterday. The majority of the Corn Belt received very little precipitation last week, and because of this, drought conditions worsened across a large portion of Ohio, northern Indiana, southwest and southeast Michigan, and northern Minnesota. Conditions also deteriorated in western Iowa, northeast Illinois, northwest Missouri, and eastern Nebraska. The High Plains also saw limited rainfall last week. Drought conditions worsened in Kansas, Oklahoma, and the western side of the Dakotas. When we look at the percentage of U.S. areas experiencing drought, corn country 7%, soybeans 8%, winter wheat 45%, spring wheat, spring wheat 21%, and cattle country also 21%. Typically, this time of year, we're not going to be overly concerned about the drought situation. What's what's done is done with regard to row crops largely. But to go back to what you mentioned, uh, Matt, the river could become problematic. So the, the forecast at Memphis is that we could be in restrictive territory by the first week of September, which means that you could see draft restrictions, load restrictions, um, which could choke up the system. It's not bad yet, but it could get there. And there's not much rain in the forecast either. No, I mean, that that's kind of where I was going is that uh, draft levels continue to kind of uh, dwindle, you know, and, and in my forecast, we're just not looking at much rain at all. And I mean, you know, from my standpoint, it's late enough in the growing season that, uh, you know, I guess if you've got beans that haven't started turning yet, everyone's always said, hey, you could still use a rain and maybe throw some weight on, uh, add a bushel or two. Uh, but it is late enough in the year that we're not necessarily wanting rain, to be honest. I mean, it'd be nice to kind of bring these crops along. But at the same time, this uh, river situation is is not something to go to sleep on. Uh, you know, we, like I said, I mean, uh, we've got some pretty important times as far as getting beans out of the Gulf here before too long. And so yeah. uh, I've got to hope that this situation doesn't get any worse. Yeah. And the, the, the thing right now is that we're actually competitive. I mean, U.S. soybeans yeah. are competitive on the export market out of both the Gulf and the PNW, um, same thing for corn. Uh, we're just not seeing the business that we'd like to see. And the last thing we need is any sort of logistics problem. USDA reported multiple flash sales on Thursday. U.S. exporters sold 7 million bushels of soybeans to China for delivery during the 24-25 marketing year. Exporters sold 4 million bushels of corn to Mexico for delivery during the 24-25 marketing year. Exporters sold 105,000 metric tons of soybean cake and meal to Vietnam for delivery during the next marketing year. And finally, exporters sold 5 million bushels of corn to unknown destinations for delivery during the next marketing year. These are, again, frequent but small sales. Uh, that bottom one, Matt, 132,000 of corn. Isn't that a China number? Isn't 132 a China number that we often yeah, see? Yeah, I mean, that, that's okay. something that we see all the time. And unknown, so, that's yeah. one of their favorite tricks. So, Well, we hope they're getting started. They have they have exactly zero bushels of, of new crop U.S. corn on the books. So if they got started and it turned into something, that could be a needle mover. It's, it's one of the very few things that could be a needle mover at this point in the ballgame. The USDA will release its monthly cattle on feed report here this afternoon. Pre-report estimates anticipate that cattle on feed as of August 1st will be steady compared to last year. Placements during July are expected to be up 3.2% year over year, and marketings during July are projected to increase 8.1%. If pre-report expectations are achieved, the market will most likely view this report as bearish. The report will be released here this afternoon at 2 o'clock Central Time. All right. So the cattle market has been uh, pretty ugly as of late. Live cattle, feeder cattle have been even worse. Uh, Matt, any predictions for the report? No, not necessarily. I do think this is probably your last, um, what I would say, neutral to bearish type report. I mean, when you look at the numbers from last year, uh, once you got into that September report, September, October, November, December, either placements or cattle on feed were 100 plus, uh, one of the two. And so, yeah, I think moving forward, they know, you know, that fundamentally there's probably some reasons to not get super bearish, but it just seems like the cattle buyer has kind of stepped away from the table here. Uh, the interest hasn't been there and money flow is pretty tough to, to buck. How much of this has to do with the, um, we, we mentioned this earlier in the week and people got all worked up. How much of this has to do with the uh, proposals from the Democrats regarding uh, price gouging and that sort of thing? I think it has something to do with it. No, oh, I think it does too. I mean, that, that's some pretty stiff talk, you know, the, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, my thought process on it is, um, you know, anytime you start talking about trying to 
uh, curb price gouging. I guess I get a little ouchy as far as a free market situation goes. But uh, I do think that uh, when people are talking that way, uh, it's going to change, you know, the way people look at things. So uh, in my opinion, you probably got some people getting a little bit spooked. Yeah. Cattle uh, were up yesterday, right? Uh, yeah, they sure were. Feeders were up a buck fifty to two seventy two higher. Live cattle were up a buck fifteen to one thirty seven higher. Box beef was slightly higher yesterday. Choice ended the day at three fifteen ninety ninety nine. That was up seventy eight cents. And select ended the day at three oh two twenty three oh two oh three. That was up ninety five cents. Outside markets kind of a mixed bag this morning. U.S. dollars about flat. The stocks are up. Uh, the S and P's up thirty two points. The Dow's up one sixty. Bonds are flat. Gold's up sixteen bucks. Crude oil's up a little bit. Have a great weekend, guys. We will talk to you on Monday.